Hi, this is lecture outline 11, video number two, about dipole-dipole forces. And from our last video, we learned that all particles, all atoms, ions, and molecules have dispersion forces. And for nonpolar uh, atoms and molecules, they're the only intermolecular force. Now, if uh, it's a polar molecule, polar molecules, in addition to dispersion forces, also have dipole-dipole forces. And here's a picture and description of dipole-dipole forces using acetone, uh, two acetone molecules as an example. I'll draw one acetone molecule. And for here, it oftentimes helps if you draw it in its proper geometry. It's not always uh, necessary to tell Uh, to draw it in its proper geometry to tell that it's polar, but it oftentimes helps. Let's see, see. So here's one molecule of acetone, and it is a polar molecule. We can draw the primary dipole here between uh, carbon and oxygen. Now, uh, what I've said for my class is true there are uh, dipoles here between the hydrogen and the carbon with the arrow pointing towards the carbon. However, these uh, typically uh, are not important to draw. You can draw them, you don't have to. Uh, however, the principal dipole here in acetone is the carbon-oxygen dipole between these two atoms here. And uh, intermolecular forces, all of them are between two different objects. So here's one molecule. I'm now gonna draw the second molecule so that the negative portion of one of the dipoles is closest to the positive portion on the other dipole because that's the dipole-dipole force. The force of attraction between a negative portion of one dipole and a positive portion on another dipole. So the dipole-dipole force, we won't draw any arrows to indicate anything or dashes or anything. It's simply, the picture is, the negative portion of one dipole is closest to the positive portion of the other molecule's dipole. And as a description, first, let's define a dipole. A dipole is a per par permanent partial separation of charge. a permanent partial separation of charge due to unequal sharing of bonding electrons. And that's an important point, several important points. First of all, it's permanent. That makes it uh, contrast with uh, London dispersion forces, the LDFs, where the dipoles are temporary, uh, very temporary, instantaneous, we call them. So that's one of the reasons why uh, these intermolecular forces are uh, generally stronger than LDF. Partial separation of charge. So we're going to see that these will involve partial charges, less than plus or minus one, and that that contrasts them with ion-ion forces, which are plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two, etc. So somewhere between those two. Uh, we have our pictures of our dipoles here, and the dipole-dipole force is the attraction between the positive portion of, sorry, the negative portion of one dipole and the positive portion of another dipole on separate molecules. So dipole-dipole forces, or the attraction between dipoles on separate molecules. Uh, 
the attraction between dipoles on separate molecules. And uh, this is a lovely picture of them. Oh, this is what I was going to say. The other thing, uh, unequal sharing of bonding electrons. The only time we will ever draw a dipole is next to a bond, be it single, double, or triple. We will never draw dipoles for pairs of electrons. So only for bonds. And every type of bond except CH will require a dipole. Okay. And if you draw them for CH, if you're going to draw them, draw them positive uh, by the hydrogens uh, pointing towards the carbons. Carbon is more electronegative. And then the motions of these cause most of them to cancel out. We could do the same thing for the other molecule. Still, the principal dipoles are aligned. Now, the effect of dipole-dipole forces on melting and boiling ports of, points of substances. We have two substances here with their molar masses, which are uh, almost identical. I would call these identical. So identical molar masses. means identical or similar, let's call this similar molar masses means similar LDF. So the LDF for these two molecules are likely to be very similar. So that when we see a differences in the boiling and melting points, it's not due to LDF. We're picking out an example where dipole-dipole forces are important. Here for ethane, we have only carbons and hydrogens. This is nonpolar. It has only LDF. And we can see boiling point, which is our primary thing we talk about for uh, trends in LDF, is minus 88. Same molar mass here, different structure. We have a dipole here. I'm even going to draw on the electrons. Dipole pointing towards the oxygen, dipole dipole forces. Plus LDF, everything has LDF. Dipole dipole forces are going to be the dominant or strongest uh, intermolecular force. For this molecule. They tend to be stronger than LDF uh, and that's why we consider them the dominant or strongest when, there's, when they're both present. And we can see that they're due to dipole-dipole forces. There's a very significant raising of the boiling point, also a very significant raising of the melting point because the intermolecular forces are stronger because they include LDF and dipole-dipole forces. And that shows up in the uh, boiling and melting points. Now, dipole-dipole uh, forces increase as the dipole moment increases. The formula for the dipole moment is, uh, and the symbol is mu, lowercase Greek letter mu, mu. And it's like a U with a uh, long line on the front of it. It's going to equal Q times R. Q in this case is the charge. And R is the distance of separation between charges. So think of it as the charge and the bond is being pulled, so um, associated with the unevenness of the sharing of the electrons. And this is great. And uh, all we have to know is that a formula for the dipole moment exists, and you can look it up if need be. We're going to have a shortcut way to estimate dipole-dipole forces that says that uh, larger dipoles 
exist for larger differences in electronegativity. Delta E N is the symbol for difference in electronegativity. So we're going to be able to compare dipole sizes based on differences in electronegativity. And that means you're going to have to know your trends in electronegativity. Um, your trends in electronegativity go from fluorine and the top left portion of the periodic table. Top right, I mean. So electronegativity decreases as you go to the left. Electronegativity decreases as you go down. So, and a couple things to remember. So first off, you will be given the important electronegativity values for anything you need on the conversion equation sheets. You'll be given them for exams, and you'll, have, of course, have those for the homeworks. But uh, it's helpful to remember that fluorine is the most electronegative, followed by oxygen. Nitrogen and chlorine are tied for third. So the dipole arrow always points towards a fluorine, almost always points towards an oxygen. The only time it doesn't is when it's bonded with fluorine. And from there, it'll be helpful to know the trends. Carbon is less electronegative than nitrogen, which is less electronegative than oxygen, and on over. Uh, good. Um, and what you have to know for the exam so uh, basically number two and be able to apply it and that electronegativity values are given when necessary to solve problems okay uh, and to determine delta en the difference in electronegativity now here's two examples um, which has the higher boiling point the, of these two molecules? You don't have to know their names. These are guides for me so that I can draw them. So uh, what we can tell, though, F means two carbons. Ene means double bond between them. And difluoro means there will be two fluorines. And the one, two just means one of them is on one of the carbons and the other is on the other. The cis means it's on the same side here. And fill in with hydrogens. On the other hand, trans, same thing, except the two fluorines are opposite. You don't have to know how to name them. If you get a problem like this, and you'll see this on the homework, you'll see that you'll be given a structure uh, like one of these. We should draw in our pairs of electrons our two fluorines. Now double bonds are rigid. When a double bond is rigid, it means that this shape, these two fluorines, are locked into place. So that if the two fluorines are on the same side, they will always be on the same side. If the two fluorines are on opposite sides, they will always be on opposite sides. These are rigid molecules. So a double bond is rigid. And we'll talk more about double bonds coming up. Now, um, again, we don't have to draw CH dipoles. We can. We will draw all other dipoles. The dipoles face the fluorines from the carbon. We're only drawing bonds, uh, sorry, dipoles for the bonds. That's all we'll ever do. And so these two dipoles are in exactly opposite directions. The dipoles exactly cancel. And when the dipoles exactly cancel, nonpolar. That's a fairly tricky case. That's why I wanted to point it out. Oftentimes, this is one of our first examples where we've had two carbons sort of acting as our central atom. Um, so this is nonpolar. These two dipoles pointing up. They have an up portion and a left and right portions. Um, these dipoles 
partially cancels, sort of like when we will uh, talk about water, or when we did talk about water. But these, there is a net dipole, and this is polar. This is a polar molecule. It has, so both of these have the same molar mass, so same LDF. which is one of the reasons this is nice, because you can see from the formulas, they have the same atoms, they have the same molar masses. This one's polar. Which one has the higher boiling point? It will be the polar one because it also has dipole-dipole forces. As its dominant or strongest type of IMF. Okay. This is probably the trickiest case. We learn a lot about molecules here. This time it's ethane. That means, ane means single bond. Eth means two carbons. So we have our bases there. Now we have a fluorine here and a fluorine here on each of them. And we have two other. Sort of drawing it in geometry, but not completely. We'll put the electron pairs around the fluorines for a sense of completeness. We're going to compare that now to 1,1. One, one. Drawing all our electron pairs. These are the same Lewis structures we've always been doing. Okay, now here's where things get tricky. These two is a, are a different case. First off, because this is a single bond, and single bonds rotate. Okay? First thing, got to know. Second thing, when we draw in our dipoles, if this sing, if this carbon-carbon bond was rigid, then we'd have the case up here and it would be polar. However, since this rotates, this, this dipole rotates and it rotates very quickly and it creates a molecule that sort of looks like this. Here's our dipole. It's carving out a circle where the uh, dipole is moving very, very, very quickly. On average, the dipole creates a cone. On average, the other fluorine dipole creates an equal cone. So on average, these two dipoles cancel out. When dipoles cancel, that means nonpolar. And only LDF. So this only LDF. Here we have two dipoles. These two dipoles create a larger sweep because there are two of them. They do not cancel out. Polar. So LDF plus dipole dipole. So here. So we learn a couple of very interesting things. First off, double bonds are rigid, single bonds rotate, and then we have to look at the fluorines all around them. Symmetry really does matter for these. Look, being able to look at the dipole and see how it cancels, really important for these two examples.